Okay, good morning everyone. We're just waiting for everyone to pile in. We'll begin in a couple of minutes. Thank you. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces in our attendees list. Thanks for everybody <laughs> for joining. It's amazing. We've had a really engaged audience week to week. It's so nice to see people show up and be interested. And I think I've been getting a lot of messages about today's talk. So I know it'll be a great discussion. We're just going to start in a couple of minutes, uh, probably at 10. Thanks. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us from around the world. My name is Sabrina Welsh, and I'm the Director of Programs and Operations at the Human Vaccines Project, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. Before we get started, I want to invite you to an event that the Human Vaccines Project is co-sponsoring as part of our partnership with the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Together with the Harvard Chan School, we launched the Human Immunomics Initiative. Our goal is to decipher effective immunity for aging adults to better protect them against diseases like COVID-19. Dr. Albert Hoffman and Dr. Yapgood Smith from the Human Immunomics Initiative will be panelists in an upcoming session of the forum, which will be held on October 1st at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. They will discuss one of the main challenges of developing an effective COVID vaccine, which is protecting aging populations. If you're interested in attending, you can find the registration link here on the slide, and we'll post the registration link on our website and send it with our newsletter as well. Vaccines typically take years of research and testing before reaching the clinic, but scientists are racing to produce a safe and effective coronavirus vaccine by next year. According to the New York Times, Currently, researchers are testing 40 vaccines in clinical trials on humans, and at least 92 preclinical vaccines are under investigation in animals. We've seen many developments, especially on the vaccine side in the last few weeks, and I know our speaker today is very closely involved in the search for a vaccine, and I'm so excited that she could join us today to speak with you about the process. Today's speaker is Dr. Sarah Gilbert from the University of Oxford. Dr. Gilbert joined the Nuffield Department of Medicine at Oxford University in 1994, and became part of the Jenner Institute within Nuffield when it was founded in 2005. Her chief research interest is the development of viral vectored vaccines that work by inducing strong and protective T and B cell responses. She leads the Jenner Institute program in influenza vaccine development and now also works on vaccines for many different emerging pathogens, including Nipah, MERS, Lassa fever, and Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Working with colleagues in the Jenner Institute research labs, the Clinical Biomanufacturing Facility, and Center for Clinical Vaccinology and Tropical Medicine, 
all situated on the Old World campus in Oxford, she is able to take novel vaccines from design to clinical development with a particular interest in the rapid transfer of vaccines into GMP manufacturing and first in human trials. She is the project leader for Oxford for the development of the COVID vaccine candidate, CHADOX1 and COVID-19. In today's meeting, Dr. Gilbert is going to talk about the rapid preclinical and clinical development of the Oxford COVID vaccine. During the presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I'll ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after she's finished her presentation. We'll have about 25 minutes for discussion, and I hope you'll take the opportunity to ask your questions about the data presented today. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Gilbert from the University of Oxford. Thank you, Sabrina. So if you can share your slides, I think we'll be all set. Great. Okay. So thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, if any of you have heard other talks I've given recently, I'm sorry to disappoint you, this one is gonna be very, very similar. Um, there's a, a certain amount of stuff that um, I can say and other areas I can't stray into. So I'm going to tell you about the, the things that I, I can tell you about. And what I want to start on is thinking about the technology that we're using first, because this is sometimes not, not fully appreciated, um, particularly by journalists who uh, make assumptions that are incorrect. So the technology that we're using is Chadox one uh, which is a replication deficient simian adenoviral vector vaccine and for this disease it expresses the spike protein of the novel coronavirus. Um, it's called NCOV-19 because we designed this and started working on it very early on before the name SARS-CoV-2 um, had been settled on and when you make a vaccine to GMP the name on the paperwork has to say exactly the same from the first time you write it to, to the end of the clinical trials uh, and that includes the spacing and the hyphenation, every, everything else. So that's why it's novel coronavirus 19 rather than SARS-CoV-2 anywhere in the name. So Chadox-1 um, is uh, a simian adenovirus, the first one produced as a vector in Oxford. There is also a Chadox-2 that we have used in clinical trials as well, derived from a different chimpanzee adenovirus serotype. Adenoviruses um, are really good at inducing strong immune responses. They uh, are alive, but when made replication deficient, they are very safe to use as well because they can't spread through the body and cause a disseminated infection. So there are replication competent viral vectors, VSV is one, measles is another, and they do spread, they replicate after vaccination, uh, spread through the body, which can be a problem in people who have compromised immune systems and, and can't prevent the, the further spread of the vaccine vector. If you have a replication deficient vector, such as MVA or, um, Foulpox9, uh, which are pox virus vectors, or in this case, an adenovirus where the E1 gene has been removed, it will infect a cell, express the genes encoded in the genome, and then it can't make any further copies of itself, so it can't spread even to one more cell, so very safe to use. So in order to manufacture the vaccine, we need a, a cell line that will supply the E1 gene in trans. So we use HEK293 cells to do that, which are widely used for many um, pharmaceutical manufacturing um, methods. We use a simian adenovirus because it's well known and, and recently demonstrated again with the COVID vaccines that if you vaccinate humans with adenovirus 5 vectored vaccines, people who have antibodies against adenovirus 5 because they've been infected with it in the past will not make such a strong immune response uh, to the vaccine within delivered by the ad5 vector as people who don't have those um, antibodies. And Ken Sino showed this recently um, again, they have been developing a COVID vaccine based on AD5. AD5 is a great vector to use, highly immunogenic, but it does have this problem that in humans, um, if you have pre-existing immunity, it dampens the immune response. We don't get that when we use um, a simian adenovirus. This adenovirus was isolated from a chimpanzee, genetically very similar the genome structure is, is almost identical to human adenoviruses. It's just a different serotype, essentially, that doesn't circulate in humans. So none of us have pre-existing antibodies to it to dampen that response. Another thing to note is that the, um, the spike protein is encoded in the genome. It doesn't form any part of the vaccine at the time that it's injected. 
the adenovirus looks like an adenovirus. It infects cells like an adenovirus. It's not carrying the spike protein on the surface of the adenovirus. Um, some people have assumed that the adenovirus itself carries a spike protein on the outside. That's not true. It's a true platform technology where the, only the gene is carried and expressed after um, infection of a human cell. So that means that we can have a lot of um, prior knowledge of how to use this vaccine technology because every time we manufacture a Chalux-1 vectored vaccine, we can use the same manufacturing process. Um, we know how that's going to look before we start to make a new vaccine. We know what the likely yields are going to be once the manufacturing process has been chosen. We know what dose we, we want to use. We know what the likely side effect profile is, and we know what types of immune response to um, expect from these vaccines. So this is one of the reasons that we can save so much time in getting into rapid emerging pathogen vaccine development is that we've already done 10 years work on this vector. So we're not starting from scratch the way when in the 1960s and 70s when um, a lot of vaccines that were being developed were live attenuated vaccines those really did take a long time to develop because it was necessary to passage those viruses the mumps virus rubella virus for example um, passage them in tissue culture and then test them to work out if they were suitably attenuated but still immunogenic and there are a lot of clinical trials done with different versions of those vaccines which were either highly reactogenic or not sufficiently immunogenic and the only way to find out was to take them into clinical studies. We're not doing that anymore, we're using platform technologies and replication deficient adenoviruses are only one of the platform technologies that we're using, DNA vaccines, RNA vaccines are also true platform technologies, um, where so much of the work is done before you even decide what the antigen is and that can really shorten development times because we don't need to have this um, long process of working out what's appropriate. We've done um, 12 different phase one studies before we started on, on NCOV-19 using antigens taken from malaria, from TB, from influenza. Um, altogether 330 people had been vaccinated prior to April. But looking at simian adenoviruses more broadly, over 6,000 people had been vaccinated with other simian adenoviruses, CHAD3, CHAD63, for example, and in all age groups. So uh, using CHAD63 in malaria vaccine trials in infants in Africa, just a few weeks old, up to flu vaccine trials in, um, in the UK using conserved flu antigens, vaccinating people in their 70s, um, and still getting very good boosting of T cell responses, very strong immunogenicity, even in older adults um, in those flu vaccine trials. So we've seen a consistent safety profile and strong immunogenicity after one dose. We do know that the reactogenicity correlates well with the dose that we use. If we increase the dose, we will see um, heart, a more reactogenic vaccine, but we will also probably, with most antigens, see a stronger immune response. And so for an emerging pathogen vaccine where we want a good immune response as possible after the first dose and not just after the second dose, using a relatively high dose and accepting that there will be reactionicity, some people will have fevers after this first dose of vaccination, is, is a pragmatic approach to vaccination. We can reduce reactionicity by giving a lower dose, but it will reduce immunogenicity. You could then boost that with a second dose, but you, you're then waiting longer to get a really strong immune response. Whereas we consider it would be beneficial to have a good strong immune response after the first vaccination and not to have to wait for a second to have a, a response which has a chance of being protected. So uh, we'd previously been working on a vaccine against another coronavirus, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, um, shown in collaboration with um, Nielcher van Dorimelen and uh, Vincent Munster at NIH Rocky Mountain Labs that it was protective in non-human primates after a single dose of the MERS vaccine. We'd done a clinical study, a phase one trial, which is also published, where we looked at three different dose levels and uh, reported on the reactionicity and the imogenicity in terms of uh, binding antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, and T cell responses to the MERS spike protein. So when we um, found out about the novel coronavirus very early in January, it was clear to me that what we should do is just go straight into a vaccine development program using exactly the same approach that we'd use for MERS. 
I know that we only have one, one clean room in our manufacturing facility. We can only make one vaccine to GMP at a time. So we had to place our bets on the one construct that we thought had the best chance of getting straight into manufacturing, clinical development and being worth testing. So we didn't stop to wait and look at different presentations of the antigen. Um, we just went with a direct copy of what we did previously for MERS. It had worked well and we knew we could do it quickly and speed was obviously of the essence. Other people have looked at different versions of the antigen um, and shown slight differences between them. That's something we started doing after we'd got the GMP manufacturing underway, not before. So we don't have any um, vaccines against human coronaviruses. And this presents a problem because we don't know what level of immune response we're trying to achieve with these vaccines. We don't know what level of neutralizing antibodies or T cell response is going to be protective. Um, however, there are veterinary vaccines against coronaviruses. Uh, there are actually two that are licensed, one for cows and one's for chickens. Uh, they're both live attenuated and they're also both bivalent vaccines. But there has been a notable failure to, dem to develop a vaccine against a coronavirus that infects cats, which is feline infectious peritonitis. And here in the early trials of a recombinant live virus vaccine, there was antibody dependent enhancement of infection after vaccination and then challenge of the cats. Now, in some experiments, there's a possibility that um, using bovine serum both to generate the vaccine and then to generate the challenge virus can result in an allergic response and that's responsible for the enhanced disease after infection, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, and there was also um, ADE seen after passive antibody transfer when transferring antibodies at low levels. And this was seen with SARS vaccine development as well. So this is something that everybody was very sensitive to when we started to develop a vaccine against um, the novel coronavirus early in the year. And we have to be able to assess the possibility of seeing enhanced disease after vaccination and then exposure to live virus with the vaccines that are now in development. So address that, um, we, we do animal studies. Um, in some of the studies in ferrets with the original SARS coronavirus, vaccinated animals showed greater severity of infection than the controls after exposure to virus, as with the feline infectious peritonitis vaccine. This was put down to a Th2 skewed immune response resulting in eosinophil infiltration of the lungs and also antibody dependent, dependent enhancement of infection again. So in our preclinical studies, we need to look for Firstly, the induction of neutralizing antibodies, not just binding antibodies. We want to see a response which is not skewed to Th2. It could be a balanced Th1, Th2 response or skewed to Th1. And we want to look for any evidence of enhanced disease after challenge assessed by the clinical scores of the animals, the virus titers in the lungs, the radiographic study of the lungs and histopathology following necropsy. So we conducted um, a series of preclinical studies and the first of these, the one done at NIH again, uh, again in parallel with the MERS vaccine study that we've previously done, this, uh, we had the data on this prior to in initiating our clinical trial. And we've done um, three further studies, another one in non-human primates, which has a different readout. We're looking at um, CT scans of the lungs and comparing those to the CT scans that we see in humans with um, COVID disease. And we have two studies um, that were done in ferrets, uh, one at Port and Down in the UK again, and one at CSIRO in Australia. And it's important to note that the point of these studies is not to determine vaccine efficacy, it's to look at vaccine safety. So we're vaccinating the animals, and then we're challenging them with a very high dose. And in the case of this first monkey study, uh, they were given the virus into the trachea, orally, intranasally, and into the eyes, at a, at a high dose of virus, so these monkeys are very thoroughly exposed. And then we're looking for the difference between the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated group after challenge and for any hint of enhanced disease after challenge. And we didn't see it. We saw very little um, viral RNA or messenger RNA in the lungs or the lavage fluid from the vaccinated monkeys um, and very, very little sign of um, infection of the lungs um, in these monkeys. So the vaccine was clearly protecting. It's not a study to determine the level of vaccine efficacy. As I said, it's all about the safety in these small numbers. Um, that's what we're looking for. But we had that information before we started to vaccinate people in our clinical study. So we had to go very quickly to get this vaccine uh, program started. As soon as the sequence was um, available, we um, did the tweaks to that sequence that we need to make to, it, to express it in the adenovirus. Um, by the middle of February, we had that in GMP manufacturing. So 
as soon as we had the first um, bacterial artificial chromosome encoding the recombinant adenovirus genome, we went not only into preclinical vaccine production and then into preclinical studies, but we also went in parallel into GMP um, production uh, so that we can prepare for the clinical studies. We weren't going to wait to get the results of the preclinical studies before thinking about doing GMP because that would have been an unnecessarily unnecessary delay. So at many places in this vaccine development timeline, we've overlapped things where we could. We've worked at risk and the risk there is to is to money because we're doing we're spending money on things that might turn out to be useless. But there's no risk to patient safety. We're not skipping um, results. We got our first preclinical immunogenicity results um, early in February. We went on to get the uh, results on the challenge study prior to starting our clinical study on the 23rd of April. And we published the data from that first clinical trial um, in July of this year. Uh, this was 1,077 participants, half of whom had had the Chalice 1 and COP19 vaccine and half of them had had a meningitis vaccine. Now we randomized 50-50 um, even from our phase one trial because at the time we were planning this study, uh, the number of cases of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection were increasing in the UK and the modelers were telling us that if we could get people vaccinated in April and May, we could get a very fast readout on efficacy. And so we wanted to include a control group, even in the phase one study, let alone phase two and phase three. Of course, what actually happened was that the cases rose so quickly um, during March that uh, the country went into lockdown on the 23rd of March and case numbers then started to drop. Um, this was absolutely necessary. The hospitals, particularly in London, were becoming overwhelmed and um, Following lockdown, the case numbers dropped, hospitalizations dropped, numbers of deaths per day dropped, uh, and the situation became much more manageable. But of course, we lost the ability to determine efficacy at a very early stage. However, we now we still expanded into phase two and phase three. We now have a lot more people vaccinated, and those, that trial is still running. So in this first study, we also had a small prime boost group. The aim, as I said, was to get a very strong immune response with a single vaccination, but we also wanted to know from the very beginning what would happen if we gave two doses, because we don't know what level of immune response we're aiming at. So we want to know if um, giving a second dose would increase that immune response uh, and if that would be something worth doing in the further studies. And we saw that the vaccine was tolerated. Um, we reported on all the local and systemic uh, reactions. They are as expected at this dose level for this type of vaccine. Uh, but we also showed that by giving paracetamol from the time of vaccination and then for the next 24 hours, uh, pain, feeling fevers, chills and muscle ache, headache and malaise were all reduced um, somewhat. They were still experienced by the volunteers, but they had a, a, a more favourable experience if they took, took paracetamol for 24 hours. Um, we also saw reactionicity from the meningitis vaccine. There were no serious adverse events. Um, and we also saw reduced reactionicity in this after the second dose in a small number of people who received it. And this is published um, and the link to it is here. So obviously we want to look at the, um, the immune responses and here are the binding antibody responses from ELISA. This is the meningitis group and you can see that on the day of vaccination, um, some of the subjects do have pre-existing titers, antibody titers to the coronavirus. At the time we started the study and were enrolling people into it, there was not a reliable serology test that we could use to see to screen our volunteers to see if they might have been exposed to the virus previously. So to begin with, we were um, not attempting to do that and um, not attempting to screen out people who might already have positive titers. As time went on and the ser serology test became available, we did start to screen out people with um, pre-existing immune responses. But here, both in the meningitis group and in the uh, Chalice 1 group, you can see there's some participants are positive at baseline, but there are more than 500 people per group. So you can see they are still in the minority. And after a single dose of the vaccine, we see um, antibody titers increasing by day 14 and, and slightly uh, higher day 28. In those who had a second dose of the vaccine, they increased again seven days after the second vaccination. And here we're comparing them to um, convalescent plasma samples, uh, a large number of them using exactly the same assay. And we can see there's a really wide spread in the level of elizotitis in convalescent plasma samples from, um, from negative, um, in people, negative antibodies in people who've been PCR positive 
uh, down to higher titers and these dark squares are people who had severe disease um, and they tend to have the higher antibody titers and the red stars are just to uh, relate to which of these samples are then shown in the neutralizing antibody assays um, on another slide and you can see that the, these red stars tend to be in the, in the higher range here. So we don't know what level of antibody response within this range will be protective, but all we can say is that we are achieving antibody titers after one or two doses that are within this range. And of course, we looked at neutralizing antibody titers, and these are the, the same um, plasma samples that I showed you on the previous slide. So people who'd recovered from PCR confirmed disease. These are some um, healthcare workers who were antibody positive, but had had an asymptomatic infection. This is an IC100 assay. So we're looking for complete absence of cytopathic effect in um, cells that had been exposed to virus mixed with the dilution of the human serum. Um, so an IC100 assay is the most stringent. It will give you the lowest readout. But here we see that after a single dose vaccination, we are able to measure um, neutralizing antibodies in this assay. And after two doses, um, they have increased. Again, one person was, um, had a high titer um, response prior to vaccination. But there are other ways of measuring neutralizing antibodies. Um, PRNT50 assays are commonly used for this virus and many others. And this, this is plaque reduction neutralization titer with a 50% reduction. So this is a four or five day assay, um, not high throughput. Uh, but we can use this assay to read out the change from day zero to day 28 and the, the, the bars here are the medians. But we can also use a higher throughput assay, which is a micro-neutralization assay. This is looking for 50% reduction in single infected cells after overnight infection. And here at a 50% level, and, and with this, some of the um, titers are off scale here, they're of the upper limit of detection. But the same data set can also be used to read out um, MN80, so 80% reduction or 90, 90% reduction. And so depending on how you read out the data from the same assay, you will get different titers. So this is just a warning to, to beware that when you're comparing antibody titers reported in different papers, they're all using different assays. They're all comparing to different convalescent serum samples and sometimes not very many of them. And what we really need is a standardized, validated and standardized set of assays possibly core labs. Core labs are not essential, standardized assays are, but we need to be able to start comparing the immune responses, particularly neutralizing antibody assay responses generated in different vaccine trials. This means that as soon as one of the vaccines um, has an efficacy readout in a clinical study, it will be possible to assess the uh, likelihood that other vaccines in clinical trials where the neutralizing antibody levels are known would be equally protective, possibly more protective, possibly not protective, and it will help um, shape phase three trials of other vaccines as soon as we have a first readout, provided we can actually compare the neutralizing antibody titers, and, and as of today that isn't really possible. You can also use a pseudo neutralization assay, so this is using pseudovirus with um, the spike protein on its surface. So this doesn't require high containment. It can be done there for a higher throughput. Again, you see widespread of uh, results from the convalescent plasma samples with the severe disease um, samples tending to be at the top. And we can also use this to measure, um, this is an IC50 assay again. So this is uh, the, the titers after um, two doses here and after, after one dose here. And we can measure T cell responses with an Elispot assay. Again, we're seeing some pre-existing responses. Uh, this may be in some cases due to exposure to the SARS coronavirus. It may be due to exposure to other human coronaviruses. And certainly in our MERS vaccine study in the UK, where there is no expectation that people have been exposed to MERS virus, we did see cross-reactive responses on the day of vaccination. But these all increase with the, in the group that received the um, coronavirus vaccine and they peak 14 days after vaccination as would be expected. Um, but these titers are not boosted by a second dose of the vaccine. It's possible that if we left it longer than four weeks between the prime and boost, we would also boost these T cell responses by using a second homologous um, vaccination. And it's also possible to increase these titers further. Um, we've seen in other studies by using a, a, a heterologous vaccine to boost. But here we're trying to keep it simple and just use the, the same vaccine. So this is now in uh, a further trials. We started phase two in older adults in May. Uh, we started phase three 
initially in adults 18 to 55 also in May, but then once we had the safety data from the older adults, uh, the older age groups were also enrolled in the phase three trial. Uh, we have a phase three in Brazil. So it's now about 10,000 people um, in the UK phase three trial. Um, we're aiming for another 10,000 in Brazil. We're about halfway there at the moment. There's a phase one, two trial in, Af in South Africa. It's really important that we test this vaccine in multiple geographic locations. We want to see how it performs in different populations, not only different ethnicities, and that is important, but also different geographical locations because where you live has some impact on um, the, uh, the microorganisms you're exposed to in daily life and that can affect vaccine responses as well. Uh, and then there's phase three trial has been initiated in the US um, aiming for 30,000 adults over the age of 18 and they're all randomized to receive um, either the coronavirus vaccine or um, a control vaccine or saline placebo and the majority of these vaccines will receive two doses, uh, so the majority of participants will receive two doses of the vaccine, having shown that it does increase the neutralizing antibody titers and not knowing if we need to do that, we're taking that approach until we have some readout on efficacy. So AstraZeneca licensed this vaccine technology from the University of Oxford earlier in the year. They obtained an exclusive license, but they're working with many different contract manufacturers around the world to manufacture this vaccine. And they've also started um, a, process of sub-licensing and one of the sub-licensees is the Serum Institute of India who will be making very large numbers of the vaccine uh, for distribution to low middle income countries. AstraZeneca are supporting Oxford uh, now with vaccine supply into the phase three studies um, and they are fully responsible for the US study and um, will be initiating studies in Russia and Japan also. There are other vaccines in advanced development as well, of course, um, two RNA vaccines, one from Moderna, one from Pfizer with BioNTech. Uh, both of these are messenger RNA encapsulated in lipid, but with somewhat different formulations. They both completed phase one studies and now go on into um, phase three studies, having chosen their dose after trying a few different dose levels in the, in the early studies. There are other adenoviral vector vaccines in development, the CanSino AD5, the Janssen AD26, which is a rare human serotype, so much less likely to have pre-existing antibodies um, to AD26 and to AD5. And then the Russian Gamaleya Institute, which is using a heterologous prime boost combination of AD5 and AD26. There are some inactivated vaccines in development. It requires um, high level containment to produce these vaccines, but it's a, it's a traditional well-tested technology and there are some protein recombinant protein or virus-like particles delivered with adjuvant um, in clinical development from uh, either Novavax or Sanofi with GSK. So to get to vaccine licensure we need to determine efficacy of the vaccine in one or more phase three trials. We need to have a large amount of information about vaccine safety and immunogenicity data um, from relevant populations. And the license will only be given if the safety and immunogenicity data for that particular population has been generated. So for the future, we will vaccinate children, but not uh, in our case until we have the first readout of efficacy from the studies in adults. We want to know that it will work before we start testing it in children. We are, however, enrolling um, HIV positive cohorts so that we can determine the adverse event profile and the immunogenicity in people with HIV to see um, if it will be a suitable vaccine for them. And in the future, we will want to enroll pregnant women into the studies. That will require, again, uh, knowledge of vaccine efficacy in, um, in non-pregnant women, and then um, suitable toxicology studies to be completed before these studies would start. But it is important to be able to in include pregnant women in the, in the trials and eventually for the population that can receive the vaccines. And once these have been um, generated, then we need to apply to regulators for approval for emergency use. And regulators in different parts of the world may take a slightly different approach to what they want to see, and they may also take a slightly different amount of time to give a decision on whether um, the vaccine can be used under emergency use licensure and what that will entail. And so we're still waiting for clarity on when we're going to be able to use these vaccines, which is not solely down to when we get the readout from the phase three trial. There are these other things to take into consideration as well. So there are so many people to acknowledge that I'm not going to attempt to name any individuals. I just wanted to particularly thank all the volunteers who come forward and take part in our clinical trials and give you a flavor 
of uh, the types of people that have been working on this from our manufacturing facility, making the vaccine to GMP, the clinical trial project managers, um, the immunology teams, both clinical and preclinical, the people coordinating the volunteers and so on. Very large team of people in Oxford and at 19 other sites in the UK, um, six sites now in Brazil, four in South Africa, um, and our collaborators AstraZeneca, who are now taking this vaccine even further into manufacturing and development. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, take any questions. Dr. Gilbert, thank you so much. It's so incredible to see what happened and, and the speed at which all this happened and the foresight to pursue it and really at risk with your team to, to manufacture this candidate and to, to have the boldness to, to do that is something that is so impressive and, and really awe-inspiring. So thank you for sharing your work with us. I am going to jump right into the questions because we're getting a lot and I know you have to hop off right at 11. Um, let's start with the data. I'm getting a lot of questions about titers and long-term protection. It looked like the titers dropped between days 42 and, 40, and uh, 56. Is there, can you, are there implications about long-term protection and, and could you comment on the, um, the titers there, please? Go back to the ELISAs. So with any immune response, there will be a rise so here we see the rise and we see a peak and then we see a decline and over time we would ex expect to see a plateau. And if I was to show you the uh, equivalent data from the MERS vaccine study, you would see it, which goes out to a year, you would see exactly that. So you can see it starting from a low level, rising, peaking, declining somewhat and then plateauing. And in the MERS vaccine study, the um, ELISA titers were maintained at about 50% of the peak uh, and they stayed that way between six months and a year after vaccination. They didn't decline any further. So declining from the peak is absolutely normal. Sure. Um, and some of what we've been hearing about in people losing their antibody responses after um, recovering from SARS-CoV infection, again, that is absolutely normal. Responses don't stay at the peak level, whether it's a T-cell response or an antibody response. Um, that simply doesn't happen. And so we actually need to follow these responses out for longer, both in the vaccine trials and in the um, natural immunity trials to, to see what's really happening. Now in naturally acquired infection, we know that with the four seasonal human coronaviruses that, that come around and infect people and give us colds every year, we get reinfected with those viruses. You don't get lifelong immunity when you've had one infection. So it's likely that the um, overall immunity is not good enough to give you really solid protection for a long time. And we see that in MERS in camels as well. Um, if you follow what happens in camel herds, young camels tend to get infected and shed a lot of virus. They're, you know, they're like toddlers with a cold. They're the ones who spraying all the virus around. Um, and then they recover. They're not very ill. They're, 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 there's hardly any noticeable in, this, in the camels at all. But then um, when they've recovered, they will maintain an antibody response, but they can still a few years later get reinfected. So that's typical of all the coronaviruses and is quite likely to be um, the case with this one too, that people will get reinfected. Um, but so far, the numbers of reinfections that have been seen are really minimal uh, compared to the number of people who've been infected. And um, I think it's most likely that the majority of people who get infected will not be reinfected for a few years, but then will become susceptible again. Um, that doesn't mean you'll see the same thing with vaccines because uh, delivering a vaccine in, from an adenovirus rather than the coronavirus could well lead to um, a different um, immune response, which can be maintained for longer. And normally with adenovirus, mediated responses, they are maintained fairly long term. Okay, thanks. So someone asked, it looks like the antibody concentrations after one dose are similar to convalescent serum, but the neutralizing titers are substantially lower. Could this be due to a lack of affinity maturation? Um, in natural infection, there was probably a longer exposure to the antigen enabling the maturation process to happen. Could you comment on that if, after the one dose versus... Um, okay, so here, here's the... Um, peak antibody response after one dose in the um, ELISA titer and we're comparing, if we look at the red stars, because these are the ones that we have the new titers to, so it's actually at the bottom end of the, the red star ones. So it's it's within the spread, but compared to these red stars, it's about, it's, it's below them. And then when we look at the neutralizing antibody response, yeah, it's below those as well. This is an IC100 assay. Unfortunately, we were trying so many different assays. I don't think we don't have those controls on all of these different assays. So um, 
I, I don't think there's really enough data here. This is a very stringent assay, um, and it's hard to, to be clear about the numbers when we're reading out such low titers. I, I think it would be reading too much into it to say that we, was, we were seeing a different type of response, and that's something that we'll look at more as we have um, more people vaccinated with two doses as well as after mm -hmm. one dose. Yeah, definitely. That, I think, answers another question that someone had, if you have additional data in humans beyond the peak of the response of the level of antibodies. So are you following these people past that and, and that's just not collected yet? Yeah, that's it's not collected yet because the uh, the next time point after eight weeks is six months. Okay, uh, that makes sense. So yeah. we haven't had our first person back at six months yet. That will be happening very, very soon because we started vaccinating at the end of April. So we'll shortly be starting our six months follow-ups. And I think we're going to follow most of them out for a year, actually, after they receive their second vaccination. So there's more data to come on that. We just haven't collected it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And have you studied the impact of memory T cell responses? We've got a few questions about the induction of memory T cells to other coronaviruses prior to vaccination and the impact on the vaccine-induced response to SARS-CoV-2. So there are certainly some low-level um, memory responses to other coronaviruses when we vaccinate people. They don't seem to have any impact. There's no correlation between the level of pre-existing response and the level of post-vaccination response. So I think they're probably such low level responses that they don't have either a positive or a negative effect on the, uh, the vaccine, which gives you a strong immune response. And um, I think the other, the pre-existing responses, uh, we, we saw this with MERS as well. There was no correlation between the pre-existing response and the post-vaccination response. Okay, great. Um, that relates to another question we had. Did the patient with previously present antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 have any adverse effect after taking the vaccine? So it sounds like, no. No, no, there was, um, I think um, we can see that they increased after vaccination. The antibody titers were, were higher after vaccination in these people who had pre-existing antibody responses, but there was no difference in the adverse event profile. So there's no, again, no correlation between having a pre-existing um, antibody response and a, a different an, uh, uh, adverse event profile after vaccination. Oh, lots of questions, guys. Thank you for sending these in. Let's see here. Okay, um, you mentioned that the same vac uh, vector delivery platform is being used for several other viral, bacterial, and parasitic vaccines. Will this limit the use of it in the future for inducing antibodies against the vector? I know you'd mentioned the AD5 and the adenovirus kind of quandary earlier. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think we have to uh, get this in, in perspective. So if somebody has... Um, been infected with adenovirus 5, they've had uh, a replication competent infection, which uh, the immune system has had to respond to and control to end that infection, and that results in immune memory to add 5. It's a very different situation when we give people one or two doses of a replication deficient viral vector, which doesn't replicate at all after we give it as a vaccination. So you get a limited amount of um, anti-vector immunity after vaccination, and we showed that in the Lancet paper but it doesn't prevent um, a boost even four weeks after vaccination. We can still boost with the same viral vector. We are looking now um, in our clinical trials at recruiting some of the participants from earlier trials who had Chadwick's one vector vaccines with different inserts in at an, at an earlier time, and then giving them the SARS-CoV-2 vac SARS vaccine to see if there's any impact of their previous vaccination with Chadox-1 on their ability to mount uh, an immune response to um, SARS-CoV-2. So that's a study that's just starting. Uh, it'll be a while before we have any data on that. Okay, great. And did you assess, I think you mentioned before, did you assess T-cell responses with any other assay apart from the LA spot, uh, like below, for example? Yeah, there's a lot more data to come out. So that's just been yeah. pre prepared for publication at the moment. So I, I hope before too many weeks have gone by that that will all be um, out in the public domain as well. Okay, that's great. I mean, you've managed to put out so much information already. It's usually it takes a lot longer to get these types of data sets out. So I'm sure there's much more coming. Um, yeah. Relatedly, you mentioned the pseudovirus assay titer. How comparable is that to replicating virus? And can you comment on the differences there with the pseudovirus assays? So we expect um, the titers that you read out from a pseudovirus assay to be higher. It's easier mm -hmm. to neutralize a pseudovirus because the density of the um, spike protein on the surface of the virus is lower. 
than it is on a coronavirus. So if you just use a pseudovirus assay, you'll tend to get a higher titer. However, it does correlate very well with the live newt assay. So provided you understand uh, what it is that you're reading out, I think it's fine to use a, a pseudovirus um, neutralization assay. Um, and it's possible to do a lot more of those assays because you don't need BSL-3 to do them. So that's mm -hmm. one reason that we, but this is a live newt assay, um, it's an IC100. These are two different types of assays, PRNT50 and MNA5080 or 90. These all need live virus. This is a pseudovirus assay, which you can do a much higher throughput, um, make it semi-automated, put it in a microtiter plate, get a lot more data. So our approach has been to use both, uh, expecting in the future probably to do more work with the pseudovirus assay, but understanding how it correlates with the live newts. Great. Okay, I've received a number of questions on the populations being enrolled into these studies and targeting different key populations. Could you comment on when the trials for children will start? What are the implications of enrolling um, children under the age of 18? And you also mentioned you were aiming to vaccinate, um, there were, there's a trial in South Africa. Are you also aiming to vaccinate 10,000 people there? And if you could comment on the hurdles of enrolling these different populations, that would be great. Okay, so, um, it was always a plan from, from the start to have um, a childhood cohort because we need to know how the vaccine will work in children. Mm -hmm. But as the, the pandemic has um, unrolled, it's become clear that the disease is not severe in children for the most part. They're certainly not the priority population to be receiving a vaccine, although they may be implicated in spreading disease. And so in the future, we'll want to be able to understand how a vaccine works in children and, and how it might be used. We've decided um, to wait until we have um, a signal that the vaccine is effective in adults before we start to vaccinate children, because we don't want to start enrolling children who, who can't give their own informed consent um, sure. before we know that the vaccine actually works. But And then we would be wanting to look at lower doses to start with. Uh, but yes, on the cards, so my colleague, Andrew Pollard, who is the chief investigator <coughs> of the vaccine trials, mm -hmm. is actually a professor of paediatrics. Uh, has been responsible for a number of very large studies of childhood vaccines. So um, he knows how to go about um, uh, the best approach to take to testing vaccines in children, and that will happen when the time is right. And Great. in these different populations, um, so um, in, no, in South Africa, it's only going to be, I think, 2,000 people. The idea was just to get some, uh, it's a phase one stroke two study rather than a phase three, um, mm -hmm. but we want to look at, you know, different parts of the world. So um, important to have African trials involved as, as well as Brazil. Absolutely. Um, and no particular issues with, with um, enrollment in those different countries, really. Um, there's, yeah, we haven't been held up by lack of volunteers at any stage. Good. And the enthusiasm seems to be there for participation, so that's great. Um, and relatedly, our responses in the 50 plus, the, the older individuals being evaluated separately, there were some studies in murine models with SARS-CoV that showed older mice did not achieve the same levels of antibodies as younger mice, and it seems that elderly will be a key group to be protected. So could you comment on the vaccine development and um, applications for older adults, please? Yes, yeah, so our phase two study in older adults started um, at the end of May, uh, two age cohorts, 56 to 69 and 70 plus. Um, so that's been running for a while now and the data is just being put together for publication. So we'll have a report on that coming out again before too much longer, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. publish on that. And we had the both the reactogenicity and the imagenicity data from those age groups before those age groups were then added into the phase three study. But, so oh, the regulators okay. had that information before the phase three started. Mm -hmm. Okay, and relatedly, I just saw an article, I think it was in the Financial Times yesterday, I have to double check, about human challenge studies. I know that's been a topic of great interest and in terms of speeding up the timeline of getting that answer. Are there any human challenge studies planned with this vaccine? Could you comment on your thoughts on just using CHIMS in general for this type of pandemic? So, I think challenge studies will be an important part of um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development overall. I don't think they're going to have any very rapid <clears throat> impact on vaccine development, though, because mm. it takes quite a long time to set up a model for challenge. So you have to understand 
um, in the population that you're going to use for the, for the challenge study, what dose you need to use, uh, what percentage of unvaccinated people you can actually infect. So uh, I worked on flu vaccine studies before, and if you manage to infect 80% of the controls, you're doing really well. And that only happens um, after you've screened the population and excluded anybody with pre-existing antibodies to the serotype that you want to challenge with. Um, in malaria vaccine studies, in the UK, everybody's susceptible to malaria. So we can have a really small control group and know that they will all get infected. That's not true of the respiratory viruses. So there's quite a bit of work to do in working out an appropriate dose, challenge dose to use, um, how large the studies need to be, how large the control group needs to be in order to get a statistically significant readout from these studies. And I also think that um, there's a possibility we get uh, a different readout on efficacy in challenge studies than we do in um, field efficacy studies, because um, it's going to be necessary to give a high enough dose to, to infect young and healthy people who might be quite hard to infect, um, and then follow them to see if there is any infection. That might not give you the same level of efficacy as if you're studying the vaccine in a whole population who are being naturally exposed potentially to much lower levels of virus. So. We need field efficacy studies, absolutely. And we need the large safety and immunogenicity database because we can't license a vaccine without it. So challenge studies are absolutely not a substitute for field efficacy studies. I think they could complement them. And when we get a bit further down the road of understanding the efficacy in, in phase three trials of some of these vaccine candidates, then being able to compare them in, in challenge studies to other vaccine candidates, we, we understand if the second generation of vaccines that haven't made it into phase three trials yet are going to be equally or effective or more effective uh, and whether some of those should then be fast tracked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, um, a couple of questions. I know <laughs> the, the big question in the room, I've gotten a lot of um, comments and inquiries. Can you comment on the adverse event that led to the temporary pause? There's some information out there. Could you give us your impressions and, and just comments on next steps and, and your overall impression of, of the event? So what we need to remember is that somebody who volunteered for a clinical trial became unwell. And the first duty is to, to them and their confidentiality. And um, information has been provided to regulators and will eventually be included in a peer reviewed publication. But um, I'm not going to say any more about the adverse event because that would be not following the rules that we need to follow for clinical trials. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, we would never want you to reveal confidential or any medical information. That's, you know, definitely part of the, the high quality nature of clinical trials. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I think this pause kind of shows how the process works. This is how clinical trials work. It's exactly mm -hmm. what's supposed to happen when, if and when an event takes place. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting time for us in, in the clinical ops side of, of the world because no one's ever, I don't know, at least in my experience, no one's ever asked us to share our protocols with the New York Times. We've never had to share that that level of study yeah. document information. So it's a it's been an interesting, I'm sure, challenging time for the for the teams. Yeah, yeah there's there's a lot of interest and, and the, the interest is um is not always beneficial to uh, the proper conduct of a trial. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm officially skipping the rest of those questions, guys. I hope that's a satisfactory answer. Um, let's see. You, it, uh, I'm still a lot of T-cell questions. Um, are you getting similar antibody and T-cell responses in the over 55 cohort? Um, I guess, could you comment on the different responses between the elderly and the young that you've seen so far? Well, I can't yet, because I have to wait until we publish it. <laughs> okay. We will publish it, when we, we'll get it out as quickly as we can, but it's probably Absolutely. not too long. And we'll share that paper when it's published, guys. We'll, we'll post it on the website and attach it to this talk um, so you can take a look. But if you're interested, we have published on the use of Tradox-1 in older adults in flu vaccine studies, um, mm -hmm. and we got very good immune responses. We're looking specifically at T-cell responses there, which was boosting pre-existing T-cell responses. Um, it was uh, very effective at boosting T-cell responses in people over the age of 50. So um, that's the published data on this technology that you can go and look at now if you're really interested. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, a few questions on the number of doses and how doses are formulated. Is the dose number, it's based on the number of particles rather than infectious particles as used in other live vaccines, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, there should be a standard 
relationship between the um, infectious particles and the total particles and the doses based on the total particles. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in terms of the number of doses, what do you think is the most likely, I mean, it's, it's hard to comment at this point, but in terms of um, a boost after the first dose or boost after the second dose, what do you think will be the most likely regimens to protect and, and what would happen in the manufacturing world after, you know, are there, are there going to be enough doses, I think was the, the ultimate question. Okay, so um, AstraZeneca have committed, I believe, to making um, 2 billion doses by the middle of 2021 and a further billion doses by the end of 2021. So that's a, that's a good portion, proportion of the doses that are going to be needed for the world. Of course, it's not enough and there need to be other vaccines developed and we will do what we can to support the development of other vaccines, particularly in terms of comparing immune responses so that we can um, if we have a, a readout in one vaccine and just immune digestive from another, can we understand which would likely be most, um, which, you know, which ones are likely to protect? But we don't know what we're aiming for. So that's mm -hmm. why in our um, clinical trials now, we're giving everybody two doses. Everybody over the age of 18 is getting two doses of the vaccine because we know that will give a stronger antibody response than giving one dose of the vaccine. It may be that we don't need to do that, particularly in the younger adults. It may be that one dose is enough, but we need the first efficacy readout and the correlate of the level of neutralizing antibodies required to protect before we can understand if we need to give everybody two doses or whether um, we could give just the um, two doses to older adults and one dose to younger. That remains to be seen. Um, when do we need to boost? Again, um, we need to follow the immune responses out um, for more than a year and see what they're maintained at um, a year or more after vaccination and then decide when would be a good time to give a further boost. Okay, so I think that answers this question. Is there any data on interference with booster dosing at six months later or later post initial dosing, um, either for MERS or another immunogen? Yeah, so there is some, some data on that and we see um, good boosting of T cell responses as well as antibody responses if you leave it six months between the two vaccine doses. You know, clearly that's not a strategy we want to follow in the first instance, but um, it, it might be something that would work uh, later on. If we discover, for example, we only need one dose in the younger adults to begin with and then boost them six months or a year later, um, that might be a good strategy. And many compliments coming in on your presentation and, and just how much data you're able to share. Are you planning to formally determine a correlative protection from the ongoing studies? Or do you know of, of plans to do that in the future? We are going to attempt to do that. Once we have an efficacy results, obviously we want the immunogenicity results to go along that and we will be attempting to determine a correlative protection. I think initially that will be an estimate. Uh, and over time, um, as with all the vaccines, that there will be um, better data on that. Yeah. So far, what we've seen in the preclinical studies is that neutralizing antibodies are, are correlating with protection, but how that translates to the level of neutralizing antibodies you need to protect a human, we don't yet know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just a few more minutes left. I have a couple of questions here on the route of administration and whether you've measured IgG responses in the mucosa are there any plans to look at an oral or a nasal vaccine? And could you comment on, on the responses you've seen so far in the upper respiratory mucosa? Okay, so, so at the moment, this is all intramuscular delivery. Um, fastest route to get into large scale trials is intramuscular delivery. We have announced that we're going to be doing a um, intranasal delivery trial um, oh, in great. conjunction with um, Chris Chew at Imperial College. Um, this type of vaccine has been given intralasally before and um, was good at Im inducing immune responses in the upper respiratory tract. And we've done that also in our preclinical studies for flu vaccine development, showing that you get better um, responses in the respiratory tract if you give the vaccine intranasally uh, than if you do by giving it intramuscularly. So um, there will be a, a, a paper with some more details of uh, immunology to come out, uh, which will have some more details in it. But um, regardless of that, we are going to be initiating this um, intranasal delivery study. What was shown in a, a TB vaccine study with a viral vector vaccine was that it was possible to get very strong immune responses, even with a lower dose when it was delivered to the respiratory tract. So it's something that we're interested to look at. To look at. It gives us um, the possibility of getting a more protective immune response with the same dose. Great, okay. And just a, an overall question looking at the program as a whole, you know, we're, 
there have been talks about the the COVID vaccine that does come if if COVID becomes a seasonal thing like the flu, will we be able to use the reuse the vaccine for future years? Is it going to be like a flu development cycle? And could you comment on just your thoughts on on developing a universal coronavirus vaccine? Well, I think a, a universal coronavirus vaccine is a little way off yet. Uh, we need to find the right antigens to put into that and then the best way to deliver them. And you know, T cell response is potentially much more important. But mm -hmm. again, it comes back to what level of immune response do we need to protect against coronaviruses? And when we understand that, we'll, we'll have a better chance of understanding if we might be able to make a, a universal coronavirus vaccine, I think. Um, so this virus is not mutating very rapidly. It's, it's not like the flu where we see drift within one season uh, and a vaccine can become useless within a, a few weeks of it even being um, given because there's already been drift away from, from the strains that are in it. That's not what happens with coronaviruses. So in terms of being able to match the predominant circulating strains, I don't think it's going to be anything like as difficult it is with flu. It may be if this is around for a long time, companies decide that they want to have an update on the antigen, but I don't think it's going to be all or nothing um, the way it is with flu vaccines. Uh, for adenovirus vectored vaccines, can we use them to boost? Probably not every year for 20, 30, 40 years, but we don't know that we even need to do that. So you know, again, that's a question, something for the future. We're concentrating on getting protection now. We do know that um, heterologous boosting works really well. If you can lay down a strong immune response with the first vaccination, you can often boost it with protein. So that, that might be an approach for the future as well if we need to keep reboosting. Oh, interesting. Okay, great. All right, so we're just at the end of our time. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so I'll share a couple of slides if you don't mind me stealing back your screen. Nope. And Sarah, thank you so much. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for the group or just words, words of wisdom to leave us with? I think these are very exciting times to be uh, working in, in vaccine development, uh, we're, but we're all in uncharted territory and the, yeah. the next few months are, are unknown for all of us, uh, for, the, for the, all of those who work on advanced clinical development, the regulators as well, and the people who have to think about rolling out a new vaccine very fast. So there's a lot of hard work still to come. Absolutely. We wish you the best of luck. Godspeed. I know, you know, you're leading the charge over there. We really appreciate all of your hard work. And thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Your schedule is really busy. I know you have to rush off to go host some visitors, so I'll let you go. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I'll leave you now. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to all our attendees for joining today. You know, these lab meetings are really interesting for us, but they're also, they only happen when you ask questions and you're such an engaged audience. So we really appreciate you joining and asking all your questions today. I'd like to invite you to join us two weeks from today on the next Global COVID Lab Meeting, which is scheduled on October 8th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Our next speaker will be Dr. Emmanuel Andreano from Toscana Life Sciences, who will talk about poly polyclonal and monoclonal antibody responses of COVID-19. If you're interested in more research on COVID-19, please sign up for the HVP COVID Report. In this newsletter, we present insights from experts all around the globe and highlight the latest scientific articles and data. And finally, please feel free to visit our website and follow us on LinkedIn, where we'll upload a recording of this webinar for you to review. And with that, I'll say thank you again for joining. Stay safe, and we hope that you'll join us again on the next Global COVID Lab Meeting. Thanks, everybody.